So welcome everybody who's uh, joining us, whether it be your evening, whether it be your morning, or whether it be some unspecified time in the middle of the day. Uh, my name is Tony Seish, and I'm the director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And I just wanted to start with a few announcements before we move on to uh, the event uh, for this session. So today's session is set up with simultaneous English-Chinese uh, interpretation, and you can select your preferred language by clicking on the globe icon on the right side of the toolbar, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. So I also like, of course, to acknowledge the co-sponsors for today's talk. So along with the Ash Center, uh, the event is co-sponsored by the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, and we have with us uh, Winnie Yip, uh, who is currently acting director of the center, and also the HKS uh, China Society, which is a student organization here at the Kennedy School. And this discussion, of course, is hosted in collaboration with the China Development Research Foundation. Also, this event is being recorded, and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel. Uh, as usual, you are invited and welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the duration of the event. If you want to do so, please do that via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen instead of submitting them uh, via the chat when they might uh, get missed. So when I was a student uh, in China at the end of, towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, China was an overwhelmingly poor country. It was primarily a rural and seemingly lost in terms of direction. Yet if we look at over 40 years of reform, the changes have been unimaginable. And they're ones that actually took us in the West centuries to adapt to. We've seen economic growth raising hundreds of millions out of poverty. We've seen a massive increase in urbanization and we've seen a stronger role for the Chinese nation in global affairs. Of course, it's also come with some downsides, some problems related to environmental damage, inequality, and so forth. But what does it mean actually in human terms? And fortunately, our graduate friend and colleague, Lu Mai, together uh, with his team, uh, have brought together 40 vignettes for us of what the changes have meant for individuals, revealing the types of social mobility that reform has offered to those individuals. And I think most importantly, what it does for us is it provides a human face to the statistics that have dazzled many of us in the West. And those in the vignettes, they range from those born in the 1930s all the way through to those born in the 2000s. And it talks about what the China dream actually has meant uh, to them. So to discuss this, we have with us our featured guest today, Mr. Lu Mai. Lu Mai is the vice chairman of the state councils China Development Research Foundation, and previously served for a long period of time as its Secretary General. And it's a great pleasure to welcome a friend and graduate of the Kennedy School to be with us today. In addition, also joining us, we have two colleagues here from Harvard. First is Professor Jason Furman, who is the Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy, jointly here at the Kennedy School, but also with the Department of Economics. And as many of you will know, uh, Jason was a senior advisor to President Obama for a number of years. And between August 2013 and January 2017, he acted both as President Obama's chief economist and a member of the cabinet. And then in addition, we are lucky to have with us uh, Professor Winnie Yip, who, as I mentioned before, is the acting director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard and is also, of course, a professor of practice of global health policy and economics in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H.E. Chan School of Public Health. So let me just quickly review the format. We're going to turn things over to uh, Mr. Lu Mai, who will speak for a little while, and then will show us a number of short videos. And then we'll come to have some discussion with Professors Furman and Yip about what are some of the consequences of this are, 
and then leave time uh, to open up for questions uh, from those who are attending today. So with that, let me please turn it over to you, uh, Lumai. Thank you, uh, Professor Sachs, uh, Sage, uh, for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to have a chance uh, to speak here and the thanks the uh, Air Center and the Fairbank Center hold this uh, event for China Development Forum uh, Foundation. Today, I, will, I would like to talk about the book uh, just uh, launched uh, in English version of a Chinese dream and the ordinary Chinese people. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I have uh, some PPT. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, this is the project that we run, but uh, uh, first, uh, why we do this uh, project? Uh, in China Deve Development Research Foundation is nonprofit organization. And uh, in 2005, we write a China Human Development Report with uh, UNDP in China. And uh, the, the uh, title is uh, Achieve, uh, Development with Equity. So since then, we're working on this, how to improve the uh, social mobility, how to achieve uh, social equity. At that time, we read uh, several books, including the book of our kids. You see the left uh, picture. I received my uh, certification from uh, Dean uh, Putman, uh, Putman uh, that's him, and uh, the book uh, come out. 2016. The title includes the, the sentence, the American dream in crisis. That's really raised a, a, a curious uh, attention uh, from us. So the changes of American dream over the years described in our kids uh, promote our source and looking the evolution of the Chinese dream. So the method and the framework uh, Professor Putman used uh, is uh, very interesting. So we, let, we then look at the, uh, the term of Chinese dream and uh, we would like to prepare Chinese dream and the American dream is any similarity. And also we would like to learn from uh, US lessons, US experience about the American dream, how to achieve that, and what's the situation. And for Chinese, should, how should we uh, prevent some bad uh, situation? Second. So uh, Chinese, the, the, the term first appeared in the Asian document around uh, 2000 years ago, uh, the Mengxiang but uh, it's put forward by the President Xi Jinping in 2012. Link the rejuvenation, uh, uh, rejuvenation of the Chinese nation with the aspiration of the people to live better life. So this Chinese dream have a uh, two part. One part is uh, about the national uh, rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenation and uh, another part is uh, people's uh, life uh, for, for better life. So this uh, Chinese dream term uh, reflect the hopes of the people and the purpose of the mission of the Communist Party of China. So in China, the media usually uh, emphasize uh, the national part, but for us, uh, we think the most important things is another part is uh, people and uh, their dreams. So we conduct uh, our project. Uh, so this project uh, includes uh, two parts. Uh, the quantitative uh, research, that's uh, in cooperation with the uh, Beijing Dataway Horizontal Company and uh, Mr. Yuan Yue. So the finding is very interesting. If any company are interested to look at Chinese market, uh, they should uh, read this. The hope and the wants of Chinese people changed with the country's social and economic development in the past few decades. In that project, in the uh, report, uh, it could uh, talk about that. But 
very interesting the part is another one is uh, uh, in this uh, interviews. We do the 100 cases uh, interview and uh, finally we decided to choose uh, 40 of them uh, selected cases. So it's uh, uh, covered people uh, from the age of uh, 15 to the over 18. So they come uh, from a different ethnic group, whereas the occupation, location, and the work through the different stage of life. So there are uh, some of them were successful, uh, but some of them maybe not so successful, but each of them did uh, uh, do uh, need uh, some uh, 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 interview and the report. So first, uh, uh, we choose uh, four of them uh, from these uh, 40 cases to shoot a short video. So today I will show you four of those uh, very short uh, radio. First uh, is about eight la old lady. Uh, he, she is a farmer uh, and uh, she was born uh, in 1936. So uh, let's see Zhu Huang. No, <laughs> Go Go Uh, so this is the story of Su Hong. Uh, she experienced the hunger and the extreme poverty before the PRC was founded. Uh, he, her village was invaded by the Japanese army, work on the collective farm and the commune in the 50s, 1950s. Then through the land reform in 1980s and continued to work hard on the farm till today. He grew the vegetable by herself and uh, he raised uh, two pigs and uh, raised these uh, ducks and uh, chickens. He, uh, she received a pension from the government of 400 yuan per month. That's uh, 60 uh, US dollar uh, per month. So this is the uh, farmers. Next one, I will tell about the uh, uh, worker. So, I 
。嗯，我媳妇也是我一个单位的，原先。我们俩刚去的时候在车间实习嘛，属于技术员，福利待遇也挺好。刚上班时那个国企的，散漫松懈，你可以晚来一会儿，可以早走一会儿。都是天天我就去了，跟茶水一端，报纸一摊。下班了，走了，就是混日子。有些企业资不抵债了，已经，就剩个壳了，才形成这个下岗。全员下岗了，那不是？大家就感觉，哎呀，突然一下，铁饭碗没了，就感觉挺迷茫的。哎呀，这突然就不知道干啥了。毕竟说的年龄不大嘛，也算是给自己一个机会。四 S 店招聘嘛，完了去上那应聘的。他这个管理就是特别规范。为啥我没下岗？去找那咋招工？你过来我就调过去了，把这个下岗躲过去了。这一期是非常高兴的，因为一期的名字大呀，对于员工的一个人们带的这个效益也高。现在有整套的管理体系，从加工技术上也是有很大的个提高。我现在都是说自动化，效率它也是非常高的So this is a story of Bai Yi in 1970s. He worked in the state-owned enterprises and also his wife. Uh, but uh, in 1990s, uh, there is a massive uh, layoff uh, in those uh, country, uh, in the, those uh, state-owned enterprises. Two third of the state-owned enterprises privatized uh, or become the joint venture. And 40% uh, of them, uh, the worker was laid off. So totally it's 44 million of them, just uh, like the lady was work, uh, 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 laid off uh, from uh, their own enterprises. But they continue. Uh, Bai Yi, uh, studied at the college during his work, uh, working day, and uh, uh, hard, uh, he has uh, several patents and uh, technical skill. So he still work in that uh, company, uh, the, uh, the first uh, auto company. And uh, now uh, his son uh, grows up and uh, his son work in the private education company. and. Uh, uh, he said he want to help uh, rural poor kids uh, to grow up. So this is uh, one of the story about the worker. The third story, let's see the young people uh, graduate from uh, uh, U.S. University. Right. Xi'an对我来说是我的家,生活养我的地方,是我父母生活的地方。对我虽然是特别的严厉了，小的时候如果我们考试呢，成绩不够好呢，我就不来揍。其实当时呢，因为家里管我管得太紧了，我就特别想离开家里，离走远一点。当时呢，想去上海。
啊，最好能考上海交大，这是我当时的梦想。但是呢，事与愿违，没考好，成绩不太够。那跟家人商量了，最后协调上了西安交大。后来呢，就是有了机会，呃，可以转学去美国的学校。去了那边之后，我开始慢慢学会自己调整，主动的去学习，慢慢变成了别人要我学到我要学，来完成自己的目标。呃，小的时候我也想考个上海的大学，这对我也是一个梦想之地，所以后来就决定来上海继续发展，那就回到了国内。So this is the story about the uh, Qin Mo. Uh, he was born in Xi'an and uh, was raised uh, in a well-educated family. He studied in the U.S. and uh, has seen the world for himself. Now he would like to have a free choice on his own life and also look after his parents who stay in his hometown. He take a high-speed railway from Shanghai to Xi'an so to see uh, his parents uh, regularly. But uh, the good news, we heard that uh, he married, uh, he have, have a wedding uh, in this uh, May 1st. So very good news. Let's see the next one. Next one is uh, Yang. I'm Yuan Han. I'm a daughter. I'm the first graduate of the United States. 我小时候对我母亲、对我父亲，这是一种埋怨。人家的爸妈都在身边，为什么我的爸妈不在身边？两千年时，我是经济最苦的时候，我就出去打工了。二零一六年的时候，我需要去实习，那么我就去了东莞的我爸那里。那一年时间。是我们父子两个相处最长的一年，原来有父亲陪伴在身边是这种感觉。实习结束之后，跟我爸聊了很多。我最近我都一直在思考一个问题，就是我毕业之后我何去何从？我想回去搞一个自己的自己想要的工作。这这也是你的梦想。二零一六年十一月，我们一家人就回来了。这规划就是，这是一个百亩果园，李子园，然后桃园、梨园和石榴园，一共四大块。
So this is the story of young kids who used to be left behind of children because parents are migrating to city to earn a living. So uh, tension between the son and the father because of childhood experience, the experiences, uh, but later it's re resolved. Uh, in the video, you see the picture that uh, they negotiate with the neighbor farms and uh, rent the land and uh, have a big farm. Uh, so very interesting story. And uh, uh, Xiao Yuan still study in the university and uh, his, wife, uh, his father and uh, he, he uh, work together uh, to run this uh, farm. Very interesting story. So this four story uh, is about the different people in the different stage of their life. Uh, only of 10% uh, uh, of these uh, 40 cases. But from those uh, 40 cases, uh, we see the uh, common characters. I would like to mention six of these. I would like to go uh, faster. Uh, first is a better life is the goal. The wishes and the dreams of most Chinese people are to have a better life, higher social economic status, and a better living environment. The pursuit of better education, jobs, and the income persist of every uh, generation we interviewed. Second, they believe in hard work. Chinese people believe that by continuously working hard, uh, our dream can come true. The nation value is hard work, safety, and uh, encourage the spirit of uh, uh, never give up. Uh, third, family matters. Traditional values of family play a crucial role for ordinary Chinese people's life. Uh, the family members support and help each other in pursuit of their dreams. The fourth, reform and opening up create opportunities for the Chinese people. Market economy and the improvement of governance in China provide the opportunity for ordinary Chinese people to realize their dreams, succeed in the life. They have a much more opportunity compared with uh, my age in 1980s or earlier 1990s. Now, uh, all Chinese people uh, enjoy the freedom for migration, to set up a business, to go abroad, to study uh, in the university or vocational uh, school, or uh, find uh, jobs. So they have a lot of uh, choice. They need to make a lot of decisions, not like uh, uh, me uh, before. The fifth is education is the key. Access uh, to the education plays an important role for people of every generation. To realize their dreams, break the transmission of the poverty and the promote upward mobility is important, the, the education. So the several events like uh, 1977, resumption of the college entrance examination, and uh, 1999, the college expansion plan, all those are uh, very important uh, events and uh, provide the uh, opportunity for the people to change their life. The sixth, the personal dream is aligned with the national development. Uh, national prosperity and the development over the past years are important prerequisites for the realization of personal dream. While the efforts made by the Chinese to realize their dream are crucial foundation for the national prosperity. So for the Chinese dream, the two parts actually goes together, the national and the personal, they goes together, that's uh, important. So our study is uh, based on the uh, interview 
is a case study. But what about the general picture? What about the whole pictures? We know in China, uh, the income pers perspect uh, prosperity is still a big, uh, is still a problem. So that's the reason uh, the government has a, a, a battle to fight with the poverty. And now uh, say we want to achieve a, a common prosperity. But in, in general, uh, the people has a better intergeneration uh, income mobility uh, in China. If we look at World Bank's data, uh, 2018 World Bank uh, report shows that the intergenerational uh, uh, income mobility of Chinese residents is closer to Japan, lower than Canada and the Nordic country. So, uh, but higher than the India, Brazil and the United States. So people have a better chance uh, to move upward. If we see another term, that means the uh, expansion of a uh, middle income. In this table, it shows uh, four uh, different uh, measure of uh, a different standard to see the uh, middle income. Let's see the last row uh, made by Li Shi. This uh, means the annual household income uh, from uh, 100,000 to 500,000. So in 1995, uh, this uh, middle income is only 0.2%. But uh, uh, 2018 uh, is expanded to about 30%, 30%. And uh, still 70% uh, low income in China and the uh, high income uh, group is only 0.4% in China. But uh, what people think about their future? This is a survey made by Development Research Center of State Council every year since 2011. And, uh, is con they conduct a, a big uh, survey uh, sample is uh, 50,000 uh, residents. So the result shows uh, about uh, their livelihood, their, 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 their com uh, they think about it, satisfy or not satisfy. And uh, one question is about uh, their confidence. So the uh, data shows uh, this is from uh, 1913. Uh, no, I, I just uh, choose uh, uh, several years uh, due to the, uh, so this PPT can, can help. So if you look at uh, 2020, it shows uh, more than 70% of the people uh, have a confidence or very confident about their future. And 80%, uh, 18% of them, uh, feels average or means uh, so so or okay, but uh, 77 percent of them feel less confidence or no confidence. They need uh, help. But in general, this is uh, very encouraging. The people think they have a better future for themselves or for their their children. But what's the problem? As I mentioned, the income gap. And uh, if we divided the uh, people from uh, uh, their income, according to their income to five group, we can see the middle income, middle income and the middle high income group really to have a better opportunity uh, to move up. But the fathers in the low income and the high income group are more likely to pass uh, their favorable un or unfavorable income status to their children. So it need to uh, pay special attention, especially for low income group of people. So that's the uh, reason uh, CDF conduct a, a social experiment 
and uh, we do the pilot and uh, we do the research and uh, then uh, we give a policy suggestion to the government. When government uh, take the suggestions to make a decision, we do the evaluation and uh, try to see the improvement. Here we just uh, mentioned two uh, program uh, from uh, 10 uh, we run. So uh, in investing in the de uh, disadvantaged children in the uh, foundational way of, uh, to break the intergenerational uh, transmission of the poverty. So one is uh, home visiting in the village. Now we run it in the 11 counties uh, to do the experiment. Another one is uh, one village, uh, one preschool. We run that in 30 counties. Uh, now in the many uh, province it be already become the government policy. So we do this uh, with the cooperation uh, with the foreign academy. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one way to one preschool evaluation uh, in cooperation with uh, Professor Catherine Snow, uh, graduate school of education at Harvard University. Another uh, evaluation is there from uh, with uh, uh, Chicago University. Professor James Heckman uh, is about the China Reach study, the home visiting program, and uh, he did uh, the research uh, to assessment of a pilot project in Gansu Huachi County, but also he visited uh, another pilot. Uh, in Tibet, the Nimu County, uh, with uh, grandpa, grandma, home visitor, and uh, me, and the child. So uh, that's the very good uh, picture. So the result is very uh, encouraging. Uh, uh, was, uh, it shows uh, very effective for children's uh, language, uh, social emotional development, especially for the language development. So, uh, this is uh, what I want to say uh, about this. And uh, in general, I want to say the story in the book described the vivid uh, life experience uh, of ordinary Chinese people uh, in their pursuit of dream. I feel emotionally closer to these people and uh, looking back to my own life, they are just uh, like my brother sisters, nephews, and the neighbors. And I hope if you have some time to read the story, I hope that you will have the feeling that we are all human beings connected emotionally together. There's nothing to fear about it. That's uh, what I want to say. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Lumai. Uh... As I said at the beginning, I think what is uh, very impressive and moving about this is the way it links those individual human stories uh, to the broader trend of development in China and what it means to people. And both on positives, but also in terms of challenges that people are facing in their lives. Uh, with uh, Madam Su Hong, who went through the period of the collectives and the communization and is now finding a different life since the rural reforms began in China. Similarly with the uh, Boyi and the Bai and the family uh, that went through that uh, tremendous layoff in the state-owned enterprises in the late 1990s. And then looking at the younger people, of course, uh, who live in a different world um, where there's much more freedom of choice about marriage partner, about whether they travel overseas, uh, which are just uh, unfathomable changes uh, from the China that I first landed in. Uh, and I'd like to say, I also worked in a commune while I was a student in China. I don't think I hit the seven or eight points a day that uh, Madam Su Hong reached. I, my labor probably only gave me three or four points uh, a day, I would think. But uh, there's a lot of issues raised there. And uh, I'd like to turn first maybe to Winnie. And you know, one of the other questions, of course, is about the contribution that health 
place in development. And we know that in China, particularly in the rural area, even in the reform period, there was an initial phase of tremendous problems uh, with the health system. And so I'd like to ask you really um, what you think about the advances in health and what those have meant to everyday life. And we had one question popped up in the Q&A, which I think you're in the best place to answer, was whether China actually has a national health program. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Lumai and uh, Tony for inviting me. Um, first of all, I want to concur and say that how powerful it is to tell the story of China's 40 years of development through human lives. And um, in the area of health, if you read the story, and I encourage everybody who's attending today to read the book, and uh, I actually would like to see the video as well because they are so moving. Um, there are a lot of stories in the earlier times that talk about people's worry in health. And in fact, some of their dream is just saying that my dream is to not get sick because if they get sick, then it is such huge financial burden on the family, on themselves. And there's a lot of saying about the worry of getting sick. And there are also stories about people who actually is incurring major financial burden and bankruptcy because of paying for health care. There's another moving story of a man remembering his wife who died four years ago because of delayed care and therefore died prematurely. And, but then towards the later part, um, China really had made a major, major investment in healthcare. And in fact, in a short period of 10 years from 2009 to about 20, 10, within 10 years of that period, China actually quadrupled its spending in healthcare. And yes, it has established a national health insurance program, so to speak. I mean, they're fragmented still, but the intention is to merge them into one single program in a year or two. And it also comes through in the stories that people are not so worried about not being able to pay for health care, especially for the rural population. But you can also see that people are now raising their expectations. So this goes to the dream. I think the dream is a moving target, right? Over time, people's expectations have also gone up. And now people is also worry about the quality of care that they get, the trust that they can have in their providers. And that actually came through in the same survey that Professor Lumai um, cited, um, which is the State Council's Development um, Research Center's annual survey on people's livelihood. In fact, when they, uh, people were asked, what are the things that uh, they're most concerned with? Number one is still income. And number two, it is in fact still health. And I interpreted it as not so much about not being able to get health care like before, but more about the quality of care that they are able to get and also still the big financial risk. Um, I want to um, uh, talk about one story that I find particularly moving in the book. As the Chinese population ages, how do we deal with this aging population? And I want to quote this uh, story, which is titled Aging with Dignity. And the main character in that story said explicitly that his dream is to live and leave the life with dignity, to have a right to choose to live and die. And in fact, the, the government would grant them euthanasia. And, 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 and the, he summarized it as his dream is to live healthily, to live longer, and to live peacefully. And I think that as China moved to the next phase, in addition to provide the more physical health care, um, China would probably have to think about the new dreams that people are now having given that they have already secured the material part of their livelihood, what more do they want in terms of better quality of care, better dignity in terms of aging and dying? Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here. Great. Thanks, Winnie. Yes, we're sure we're going to come back to some of those questions, also seeing what's been popping up in, in the chat. So, Jason, perhaps I, I could... Uh, turn to you. Um, what we saw in those stories was a process of extraordinary change in terms of the way the economy was functioning. I mentioned earlier the breakup of the communes to uh, 
more household-based farming uh, came through, the restructuring of the economy, which is uh, attempted in the late uh, 1980s uh, and, and so forth. So China's obviously come a very long way, but still in terms of uh, meeting the, the uh, 100 year slogan almost of uh, becoming a nation of wealth and power, it still has quite a way to go. So how, where would you see the major economic challenges and what might you see as some of the most effective things that might be done to keep this forward momentum going? Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my first visit to China was in 1985. As a high school student, I spent a uh, summer there and I've been back many times since. And, and like you, Tony, like everyone who's been to China, um, it's just one of the most unbelievable um, transformations that one could imagine. Um, but the important thing, uh, your question was forward looking, uh, not backward looking. And you know, a lot of the low hanging fruit of the transformation, I think has already been picked. You know, moving from incredibly inefficient rural areas to more efficient urban areas, um, allowing the market um, to play a role, allowing the creation of non-state owned enterprises um, and the like. The next phase is harder. Um, it's always harder. Um, I don't believe in a middle income trap, but I believe in the economics of convergence. And the economics of convergence is the farther you are from the frontier, the easier it is to grow because you can copy and adapt more ideas and capital may have um, a higher return when you have less of it. Um, China is now innovating and developing and pioneering ideas and other countries, in fact, in many areas like FinTech are learning from China. China's doing that uh, very impressively, but that's still harder. Um, that's harder for any country. Um, at the same time, some trends have gone in a good direction, but have a really long way to go. Um, I should have caveated this, by the way, by saying, insofar as I know anything about China, it's from listening to Lu Mai over the years, and, and I only imperfectly know any of it. So um, please add a caveat to everything I'm saying. This is just my own, uh, my own perspective, and, and some of it I'm, I'm more than happy to be corrected on and learn. But um, you know, going forward, I think one transformation has gone in the right direction. It still has a ways to go. And the great news is it is the, uh, a place where you can do a fun thing and grow faster. Um, and that's rebalancing. Um, in 2006, China's economy had a current account surplus of 10% of GDP. It was incredibly dependent on the rest of the world for growth. When you look domestically, it was very dependent on investment and not consumption. It's almost inevitable that China's growth will slow from the phenomenal rates that it had before. But the nice thing is that consumption growth does not need to slow as much as GDP growth. In fact, it would be good for consumption growth to outpace GDP growth so that consumption continues to rise as a share of GDP. Um, consumption has risen in some as a share of GDP. That's helped the economy rebalance away from a dependence on the rest of the world and away from a dependence on investment um, to consumption. But there's a lot more to do um, to have a more normal balance um, because China still invests such a large fraction of its GDP um, that there's no country in the world that's capable of allocating that amount efficiently. And a lot of it goes to waste, especially in things like construction. Um, the second part of the rebalancing is um, in some ways paused uh, the progress. And that's away from state-owned enterprises and towards the market playing a more decisive role in the economy. Um, to allocate uh, that level of investment, one is invest less and two, invest better. And you know, my perception is that there had been a lot of progress, um, but to some degree it's stalled and that more needs to be done to um, empower um, the, the private sector and have less of a role for state-owned enterprises. And the next set of economic reforms 
we'll need to continue making progress. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, some of the things like a better social safety net, um, improved education and the like, those are the types of measures that you know, in some countries are a trade-off. You, know, you, you worry that they reduce saving, but they help people. Um, in China, those are win-win. Um, insofar as they reduce saving and help people, um, that's actually good for rebalancing towards a healthier and more sustainable form of economic growth. Um, as I said, uh, all caveats on all of the above, happy. Uh, if anyone disagrees, it's more likely that I'm wrong uh, than, uh, than, than uh, that, that, that we have a genuine disagreement. Great, thanks, uh, Jason. Um, maybe, uh, Lumay, I could start with one question just about the project itself. And then we do have some follow-up questions which touch on some of the issues that uh, Winnie and Jason uh, have raised. It, one, of the, one of the questions was um, actually about the selection. Why, why were these 40 chosen out of this, the 100? And did the other 60 tell a different story or was it just a question of sort of a scale and uh, what is feasible in terms of publishing? Oh. I should say uh, uh, the decision made is by me mm -hmm. to choose uh, from uh, 100. No uh, pressure from uh, government or anybody else. So the question is about the balance, the background, the uh, occupation, uh, the aging, and we, we need to think about the population uh, and the, the distribution from a different area. Still, uh, some cases uh, come from the uh, same county, or two of them come from the same village, but they represent, one is the owner, another one is the uh, uh, track driver. So I decided we, we uh, leave this uh, together. So about this 40, uh, two, four or five of them, uh, uh, the, the, the story tell is about the very pessimistic. Uh, it's not very successful, uh, including the Professor Yip's uh, choose uh, one about that, that case. He is a little bit uh, worried and a little bit uh, disappointed. So uh, I, I said 70% uh, of uh, uh, the people uh, satisfies their, their life, but 10% of them dissatisfied. So I use that the four or five people are dissatisfied. But among the others, we still can see some very sad story. Please, uh, Professor, you, you, you should read that one. The young guys uh, create, uh, the stay, come to the city and uh, build up their small business. And uh, the man's father, uh, the uh, grandpa, decided to go back to the village. And uh, after several days, uh, the young couple get the news, he passed. But I think probably he suicide. And uh, he don't want to be a burden of the young kids. So that's a very sad story. But uh, this is the real uh, and the real situation in China. It's not a story. All of you are very bright uh, or success. We have a Langping. That's a one very successful. And uh, you, know, you all know about her. But uh, most of them are ordinary Chinese uh, people. So that's the reason we, we, we choose. If anything, anybody interested in the others, I can send some of to, to, to you to make a judgment. But uh, among those 40, I think he's good. Uh, <laughs> they yeah, need nothing you. to cover up. Yeah. No, no, I don't think people were had that necessarily as their intent. I think they were just interested in what these 40 stories told us and what perhaps the other 60 said as well. Um, a number of people sort of picked up on uh, some of the themes uh, that were mentioned there. And one asked about, particularly when talking about aspirations and equity, 
whether you feel that the reform of the HUCO system, that's the household registration system, uh, is important uh, to enhancing life chances and equity for people across China. Uh, yes, it's true. And uh, uh, in my preface, I mentioned this, if we want to achieve uh, equi social equity, the urban and the rural uh, should develop together and uh, free migration should be. But uh, nowadays, uh, I think government uh, has a plan to open the big city, a large city, but not uh, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. Uh, the, every other uh, should open and, uh, to the migrants. The issue is uh, some migrants uh, do not want to leave their land and their home. So they still buy a house in the county or township. Uh, they, they may not go back to the village, but they cannot stay in the large city. They do not like the life style in there. Yeah. So freedom is important for that. Yeah. I mean, it's also the question was raised because I came up in one of those videos about how prevalent is this question of left behind children and how much of a problem has that been uh, in China? Uh, left behind of children is a problem. So the government has set up a leading group and uh, uh, to try to deal with it. The, when the children uh, grow up, they need a laugh. Uh, either this uh, laugh uh, care come from parents or from a grandpa or grandma. Uh, it will be the same, but at least there is a one people really take care, take care of them, to talk with them, uh, love them, and uh, show their love uh, to them. So it's still a problem. We set up a, a village kindergarten we sent up a home visitor to those family. Uh, those uh, women uh, played a role, just uh, like a mama, to help those uh, children. So this is not a final so solution. In the city, you need uh, uh, affordable uh, housing uh, for those uh, migrants. Otherwise, uh, they cannot uh, pay the rents and uh, they cannot pay the price. Uh, to buy the house in the large city. That's the problem. Uh, the cost is too high for them to bring the children uh, with them. Yeah, that was a quite, that was the point about the cost in the city was something that came up with uh, one of the uh, other people. I mean, one thing that Scott Rosell has written about recently in his book on Invisible China actually is uh, related to this question of the upbringing and education that children do get in the countryside. And he points out that whereas in, in many Western countries, parents are continually talking to the children. Whereas often in the Chinese countryside, what he observes is because people are so busy uh, with working that children are sort of carried on their back or they're carried around and they're not getting that stimulation of parents continually playing with them and talking with them. So I think the kind of initiative you're talking about, Lu Mai, is very important. And it's probably something uh, to help China moving forward uh, would be extremely important. I know we're getting to the end of time, but if people just have a few more minutes, uh, I have one wrap up question I'd like to ask to all three of you. There are many other questions, of course, which I can't get to. But one question which has popped up a number of times is um, related to the aspirations of younger people uh, in the cities, some of the middle class, and it's a discussion which is taking place around this idea of involution and that some of the younger people uh, in urban China are not seeing the kind of chances for progress uh, moving forward. I guess that's what Ne Chuan Hua, uh, involution. Is that something that uh, was apparent at all in any of the interviews or discussions you carried out, Lumai? 
uh, I pay a sympathy to the young generation. They feel the pressure. That's a, a reason they call the Nei Jian Hua. They pay the, uh, the cost for the older generations to receive the pension. But meanwhile, they need to uh, pay the saving uh, for their pension. So that's a double, double pressure. And the competition among them, uh, compared with uh, my age, uh, is uh, more serious. But if we look at those cases, uh, the children born in 1990s or uh, in 2000, they do not uh, feel the hungry, just like me. They get the uh, right education, uh, not like me, the cultural revolution. So they did see any other uh, big problems uh, in 1980. So uh, they can go abroad, they can do what they want. Uh, they have uh, another part, not uh, only the pressure, uh, they have a lot of uh, choices and uh, I have a face on them. In my uh, organization and in my team, many of them work very hard and uh, do the good job. I learned a lot from them. Great, uh, we are a little bit over time, but let me just uh, come to a question which not surprisingly has popped up from many, many people. And I think it incorporates a number of other questions which have come up. And that is, uh, and maybe I'll start with Winnie and then Jason and let Lumai have the last word. And that is, what do you see as the major differences between the American dream and the China dream? And it's come up in different ways in the chats about, you know, do we prioritize uh, economic development over uh, political freedoms or issues and how does one think about that and uh, how do you would you see differences between a, an American dream and a China dream? Winnie, not an easy question I know. Um, I can only reflect it uh, from working in China for by now 27 years or so and also with the large group of um, faculty and students and collaborators. I think that um, the similarity, I feel that between the Chinese and the American dream is, is now very economic driven among the younger people. It's, um, it's very economic material driven and that's one major um, uh, uh, common theme. Um, but I'm also seeing that the aspiration of the Chinese is much faster. It's on a much faster changing. So every, people who are five years difference, their aspiration is very different. And because of the rapid economic growth at the rapid development that they're seeing. And so I agree with Blumai that yes, they're complaining more, they're saying there are more difficulties, but they have already satisfied all the basic needs that the older generation is worried about. So they're now on to the next set of aspiration, including living in a bigger house, going to the best university rather than just having university, or going to Bei Yi San Yuan for hospital care rather than basic care. So, so they're on an even faster, steeper treadmill, if you would ask, uh, use an imagery compared to the American gym. And um, the, uh, there is a difference also is that I feel that part of the American dream also has a conversation about society, community, whereas some of the younger people that I'm more familiar with in the Chinese dream is more centric on the individual and a little bit less on the community. And the, um, in fact, the stories um, that uh, Lumai has documented, a lot of them um, uh, uh, highlighted social relationship and social capital. I actually think that part is actually being reduced in China more and more. And so the balance between society and individual as part of the ingredient for a dream, I feel that on the Chinese side, the individual is taking a bigger share. That's really interesting, Winnie. And that question you're pointing to with rising expectations, 
that becomes increasingly difficult, it seems to me, uh, for governments uh, to be able to manage those expectations and to deal with. It's certainly something we are very uh, uh, acquainted with in the United States as uh, society becomes more diverse, interest becomes more diverse, and we create more challenges. But how would you see this, uh, this differentiation, Jason? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I have um, a special insight into it, but you know, economic growth has always gone hand in hand with a certain degree of you know, individual freedom and also a degree of disruption. Yeah. Uh, you can only have successful growth if a challenger can overthrow an incumbent and the incumbent can lose. And countries that historically over centuries have been unsuccessful um, in growth have been ones that were unwilling to allow challenges um, to the incumbents and, and not willing to allow individuals to you know, flourish and decide their own um, economic destinies. And so this conflict between you know, the next stages of growth, which will rely you know, even more on um, creativity and individual um, initiative and enterprise and um, you know, some, some strong forces pushing in the other direction, um, as well as combined with politics and the like, will, you know, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a strong view about how that will play out, but I, that's what I'd be watching. That's interesting as well. I mean, if I look at the, your concluding comments, uh, Lu Mai, you know, many of them are similar, you know, better life as a goal, belief in hard work, family matters, although of course the definition now in the US of what the family is, is uh, much more varied than the definition of the family in China, of course. Education is the key, but perhaps the last one where uh, Jason is pointing to is that in China, what your stories are showing is currently that personal dream is aligned with the national development. And perhaps this discussion around involution is beginning to sort of question uh, if that alignment uh, can still be maintained. But I'd like to give you the last word, Lumai, either on this question of how you see differences, similarities between those dreams in different countries or any other comments uh, you would like to make for us. And thank you once again for these amazing vignettes of changing life in China. Uh, I agree with uh, Jason and uh, Winnie about the differences uh, between U.S. and the dream and the Chinese, American dream and Chinese dream. The dream come from a different uh, 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 background, come from a different history, and uh, come from a different natural resources. In U.S., uh, we always feel admire what you have, the land, the natural resources, and uh, so on. But in China, we have to tie together 1.4 billion people live in this uh, environment. And uh, we need to think about the collective uh, dream, think about the national uh, stabilization, and uh, then we can achieve our personal goal. The good things that we heard that US uh, young people and the Chinese young people uh, uh, but according to the UN uh, uh, survey, the all young people uh, want to have a better environment, uh, want to protect, the, uh, prevent the climate change. That's uh, really in the common, uh, let me surprise for me. So that's uh, one common for, for, for them. Uh, also, the problem facing US and China is uh, one is same. The Professor Portman uh, point out uh, that opportunity gap between the wear off and the poor American children and the uh, young, uh, youngsters is growing. So in China, we need to learn about this and uh, prevent this uh, 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 the, the gap expansion. So uh, we admire also about your President Biden the new plan, the uh, how much 800 billion invest uh, in the children, in the, their preschool education. And I hope the Chinese government can put more money in the rural area for the children, for their 
zero to three, and uh, the three to six uh, pre the, the uh, child development. Uh, that should we should do now, uh, not too late to think about it. So I think that's an important area for the Chinese government to invest in, as it is in the U.S. And of course, uh, the children are all our futures, and let's hope that they find ways to work together more successfully than our leaders are finding at the current time. So let me thank you once again, uh, Lu Mai, uh, for giving us this opportunity to see the videos, to discuss the book, and we wish you all success with future work. And thank you again, uh, Jason and Winnie for joining. And thank you everybody on both sides who were able to put this together and also our two interpreters who've made this accessible uh, to people in different languages. So I'm afraid we're well beyond time, but uh, take care everybody.